Hey everybody, I'm Ben. I'm Karen. And we're the Shippers. We are writers, illustrators, and designers. And we are coming fresh off of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, had the virus, caught the thing, and uh, are sort of done with it. I just got my my uh, smell and taste back today. I, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly cried. It's arguably one of the, uh, I guess, least important senses that you have but i couldn't i couldn't uh i couldn't stand eating things without really tasting them and karen's fine so <laughs> no no tears shed for, for you for i'm so karen. sorry no tears shed for karen um we're going to talk about pauline baines today illustrator to the stars <laughs> most notably um c.s lewis and J.R.R. tolkien and um uh but these are her lesser known illustrations and we're not talking about story. We're just talking about her art and, uh, I'm going to read her Wikipedia page and, uh, this could be the most boring thing we do, but, um, I hope it's not, I don't think it will be. I think the illustrations will speak for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but first, uh, I am wrapping up work on Joe death and the graven image. Um, I don't have a pre-order yet, but it will be coming out from Dark Horse later this year, 2020. And um, I finished uh, doing designing and illustrating some chapter breaks uh, here, very inspired by Pauline Bain's work and medieval uh, sculpture. Um, and uh, sign up for my newsletter. Uh, at benjaminshipper.com to um, check out my what I'm working on for my next book and also uh, just yeah that's the best place to for news about my work and Valentine's Day is coming up and these are not super Valentine-y but um, they are perfect cards for your Valentine for your boyfriend for your partner for your best bud um, you're out of this world and you're my best bud um, and there's a lot more love and friendship cards you can find on my website, www.karenshipper.com. And if you go on my blog right now, you can also download some freebies for some kids' valentines and etc. The love month. Spread that love around. All right, let's <laughs> um, dive right. in. Okay. Uh, so I just love this cover. I love uh, her work is very designed um design is is in her background and uh she just makes makes work that is um so dynamic very different styles as we'll see throughout this book but um just incredible uh symbolism and she is bar she is obviously not just borrowing from wor world culture she is um illustrating world cultures and their stories, their mythologies. Um, but just the way she weaves all these illustrations and colors together is just like mastery. Yeah, painting, drawing, designing. And to put it on black, I think was a big, uh, big bold move. Um, and it works, I've, I, I don't see enough kind of like black um, backgrounds uh, for color work I think and it like just makes it real uh pop I would say it kind of fits in the uh comic vibe of uh American comics where there's deep deep blacks um and there's just so many things to look at I mean uh but uh we have to we have to move on um and we're going to show a lot of rain I would say a range in her work uh it, it is just uh, extreme. Um, and this, uh, end paper here, uh, like sort of Easter islands and like other, um, other sculpture, uh, she has a way of really getting great, um, it's like a uh, trompe l'oeil, I think is the term, French term for like fooling the eye, uh, to make you think it's, it's like stone. Um, and this is all traditional media. She was uh, operating well before um, Photoshop. Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> it's so gorgeous. Um, do you want me to flip through it while you talk? Yeah. 
That sounds and good. And then if you want to jump in um, and make any comments, feel free to. That sounds great. <laughs> I'm just going to flip through this really slowly um, while Ben voices over. <laughs> <laughs> so Pauline, Pauline Diana Baines was born in September 20, uh, 1922 and died in August 2008. She's English um, and uh, as noted before, she illustrated for Tolkien and Lewis. Um, and she got sort of on the ground level. Uh, she was in their, you know, she's English, she was in their native uh, land, and she became kind of a, a very, uh, uh, I, I would say, and because other people said, she became a close friend of Tolkien uh, and his wife. Um, her, her and her husband became very good friends with Tolkien, um, and she and her husband were only, um, two people part of the 12 uh, person um, funeral service for Tolkien. Um, so real close to him. Um, but first of all, her early life, she um, and her family were in India um, and her father worked for uh, the British government in India as a civil servant and she uh, grew up with a pet monkey <laughs> and loving her uh, Aya, uh, her nursemaid. Um, and I think here uh, she really expresses her love for India and other uh, world cultures. She knows just how to portray um, uh, art artifacts um, previously uh, previously done iconography from different cultures um, and but she didn't stay in India she moved back uh, because her mother was in poor health she moved back with her um, older sister as well who was an artist herself and then went back to England and moved around um, kind of in different uh, rooms and boarding houses um, and her father stayed behind and um, in England uh, she began her education in a convent school, uh, and the nuns in the school were, uh, were, you know, uh, mocked her f uh, fantastical imagination and her drawing, and, uh, they were not, they were not really into her speaking Hindi as well, um, and so, uh, she got a little bit of bullying, um, in that school, and later on, uh, she was at the Beaufort School, an independent girls boarding establishment. Um, and her fav favorite subject was art, <laughs> because it was easy. Um, and at 15, she followed her sister to Farnham School of Art, um, which is now uh, the University for the Creative Arts. Sorry, pause. I kind of want to take a pause real quick here. Yeah. Um, I, I find it so interesting how like sometimes she'll have these really photorealistic like drawings and then at times she does these really folk art and like you know like Greek like symbolism from like the vases and things like that it's but it doesn't I think the colors all tie it together but then at the same time there were some in the previous pages where there weren't colors and it's just kind of like spot illustrations but I think it works with this being a uh, dictionary, basically, of all these things. Um, it's, yeah, but she does all the styles so well, and it's... It's like a cornucopia of different yeah. images and styles, like a little fake sculpture, while uh, this is like more of a painting on pottery. Mm. Um, yeah, probably is more interesting to talk about that. <laughs> the illustrations. No, you, uh, you okay. should you should keep oh. reading, and then I'll continue to flip through, or maybe I should read that you <laughs> that way you can talk about. It. But um, I mean, the, this oh, book is so it, thick. It's going to go quick. Yeah. I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, so, in World War Two, she and her sister actually built models uh, for the aided in sort of war room drama, I guess. Um, little model tanks and little model uh, planes. I'm assuming maybe model bridges. That kind of thing and um, she also did maps uh, in, a, in the cartographer's kind of lab um, which came in handy when she would do maps for Lewis and Tolkien 
And um, she, uh, after the war in 48, uh, she began working um, for Tolkien's uh, small books like Farmer Giles of Ham and Smith of Wooten Major. Um, and Tolkien wanted her to illustrate The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings um, at that time, though uh, they weren't published. Um, he did expressly want her to do it, um, but later on, I think everyone agreed that her subject matter was more for um, kids. Um, and she illustrated uh, also The Adventures of Tom Bombadil and different um, smaller works of Tolkien. Um, she did a few covers for uh, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, and Tolkien really liked her work. I think he really liked the symbolism um, and the non-literal representation of a lot of her work. Um, Do you know how she, he came across her? Uh, she submitted her work to uh, the publisher, hmm. and it just so happened that uh, she illustrated work that would fit with Tolkien's um, Farmer Giles of Ham, um, and that was when the, the match was, was made. Um, and uh, Lewis, as well, wanted... Uh, her work for his books. Um, and they made a comment in uh, their circle that uh, Pauline's work had reduced Tolkien's story to like commentary on the illustrations because <laughs> it was so good. Um, they really liked it. And she she sort of became kind of um, the belle of the ball, I suppose, in, in that circle. Um, Lewis even <laughs> commented, it sounds like, that. Uh, he thought she was she herself was very attractive, um, but anyway. So Lewis did want her uh, work for his books, but um, upon her doing the books, he he was uh, kind of disappointed in a lot of things. He was equally, uh, I think, praiseworthy in a lot of areas, but um, mentioned that like uh, great virtues, but great uh, but great vices as well in her work, um, like she couldn't draw lines very well, uh, and children, um, it, which was, which is odd, but those books are so linked together with her work, um, oh man, I have to comment on this, so this is incredible, this like, this way of illustrating some, I don't even know what to call it, but a spiritual aspect of these two different versions and I should read all this I think it's important but <laughs> well yeah and then sorry going back to the comment before about how like there are all these different styles as I'm like looking through it I'm like obviously when it talks about a Chinese mythology she does it in a Chinese art style mm. and when it's Greek then it's more of the you know the Greek pottery and so it is she I mean it's and then the Inca like Mayan like kind of mythology and, and the like Mayan Aztec art. Um, so. She had so much reference. She actually, when she did die, she had a library of like 2,000 books. Yeah. That says. I was reading that someone actually like kind of have, have it all in like one library and it's like more than like 40 linear feet of like oh, wow. stuff of like her, <laughs> her, collected. her collected stuff, arts, etc. You know, it's really incredible. Um, yeah, but like to be able to draw in all these different styles and like I because it is a dictionary, you have to identify between the like spots, you know, like, okay, now we're switching to another like character. So doing it in that style allows her to talk about, you know, to distinguish it. But also when it's of the same story, she does it in the same style sometimes if it's yeah. like a continuous. So really um, clear illustration, um, but at the same time, beautiful and, um, yeah. Yeah, poetic. it's an extreme amount of work. I mean, it's crazy. And this type of like separation of values, it's like a color hold in comics where, you know, to show depth or to show a difference, they just, they don't even need, you know, it's so graphic. They would do gray and black 
and with white lines. Like, she does that throughout where she's stacking and layering image on image and uh, just by the differences of value. Um, so, all right, back to her life. So she, uh, her personal life, she did get married. Um, well, she wasn't a very good student. Um, she kind of frittered, frittered away her time with parties, I think is what she would say. And um, after she got, she got work and um, she did later get married to a, a traveling dog food salesman. <laughs> who was actually a German who fought with Rommel in the Africa Corps um, and who was taken to a British uh, prisoner camp and later adopted England as his native land. Um, and uh, I thought it was just really interesting that uh, they would be friends with um, Tolkien and his wife um, later on in life uh, and sharing war stories, but from from the opposite ends of the, of the, uh, conflict. That was really nice. Um, and after she, she did lose her husband, uh, in 88. And, uh, after she lost him, she, two years later, she found out that her husband had a previous wife and had kids, um, or a daughter in, in, uh, Germany. And, um, after the, the Germans kind of, uh, there's a lot of information left um, open at that time, and the daughter found Pauline Baines, and she said it was uh, something magical, like uh, coming back at me through a wardrobe. Uh, so really interesting life all throughout, I think, um, that she she led, and all the while working and uh, illustrating, I think somewhere of like 200 books, um, but just being, she was also in a group um, of people that talked about uh, life, religion, art, literature. Um, so a really dynamic person, I think, and uh, like just dedicated to making incredible images. Um, and I like this, like this extreme detail here and uh, juxtaposed with this I iconographic um, storytelling. <laughs> I just love every bit of it. Um, I was reading that she and um, Lewis, when they first met, and it was like a pretty like awkward um, meeting. <laughs> he kept checking his watch. Yeah, no, and then this is train. And then he like they were at a meal together or something. The last thing being passed around was sprouts, and nobody wanted more. And Polly was like, he kept on eating these walnuts. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the nuts out of the salad. <laughs> yeah. I I mean it, it's so funny like <clears throat> reading back on those like comp you know like. Yeah, he was, those... and he thought she was very like uh, fragile. Uh, he and so he he really tempered his um, criticism so much so that she didn't even know really that he was criticizing anything. <laughs> um, but he would be he would be a little harsher when he would talk to his friends like Dorothy Sayers, and he would say that uh, she can't draw lines. <laughs> yeah, and he he had to convince her that rowers uh, face the back of the boat instead of the front of the boat, and like. But he had to do it all really gentle because he was afraid that she would quit um, because she would be, I don't know if he would say hurt, but um, would just quit. But it, it was, it's a, quite an interesting relationship that they had. All very polite, I think, in traditional kind of English um, society. So these two gods um, are iconic in Tao, in Tao um, religion. But like, look at that detail. It's just like crazy. I mean, like normally it's like an actual statue with all these like you know carvings into it, yeah. and then here she's I don't know. It's just like and just like so, and equally like taking yeah. away detail when it when you know, know. There's, there's just it's like she came to each image on its own terms, and she didn't 
need it to interact. She didn't have to like, uh, I don't know, she had more than one filter, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which I think is just, I'm trying to grasp, like coming to something different with a different aspect and different needs. Yeah. I think it's easy as artists, especially these days, to get hung up on style and, um, or a lot of like, oh, this is so fun. Yeah. Um, it's easy. Yeah. But then like when you study, you know, artists of the past and like people who have done it for a long time to see their evolution or not even getting hung up on, like, I think she comes from a very design kind of like background almost like seeing it just to communicate what it needs to communicate without letting like style become like a resistance almost you know um this is so fun yeah um yeah the subject matter is really shining through like it makes you want to read the stories it makes you want to read the mythology yeah. um and it's there's just a lot of like power in these images it's visual communication it's like it's all communication throughout. I mean, no one, everyone is feeling or thinking or doing something in these images. I am going to pull up this um, token cover and like look at the, the way she does these trees kind of like imitate very similarly. Like, um, I love it when it's, yeah, it's just so. She's like picking the detail correctly. Like... Yeah. And then like this, I I love that there's little faces on these pairs. It's just incredible. Um, cue music now. <laughs> yeah. no, this is beautiful too. Okay. Um, how do you, do you use this book as reference a lot or do you just have you? Yeah, yeah. a lot, especially for like, uh, um, kind of trying to create a foundational world. Uh, mm -hmm. I think like this is really evident in Mike Mignola's work in Hellboy where he's, uh, he is either copying or uh, translating um catholic imagery uh catholic carving and uh just really charged imagery to it's always backdrop it's a, it's always backdrop in his world and it always works <laughs> it always works to like give the feeling of uh more or um or historical authenticity um and so that's uh, what I've tried to do in Joe Death. Um, you know, not as successful as I would like to be, uh, probably. And uh, but that's something more and more that um, I was I'm always conscious of. I think people who like, uh, let's say Miyazaki and Nasca, will see this kind of thing in Nasca all throughout, where it's fake. It's a fake world, but the fakeness of the world is is that much greater when there is an authentic um feeling of ruins and of uh of a past culture so that's really i think the takeaway for creators today which is you want your you want your stuff to feel a little nostalgic you want it to feel as if there's a foundation to your work coming from somewhere um and You've, I think, I think um, I'm reading the book on the art of Eric Carl right now, and he has a little he he has a speech at the Library of Congress where he talks about like where ideas come from, um, and I've heard about I've heard it through different people in different ways, but the way he talked about it was basically sorry I I, I bookmarked a couple of things, um, I love how like she her compositions of like things like it like the movement of it is so beautiful um using negative space here to create that like um visual direction um to move down on that tree but then like also bringing it up with your eye through this curve um and this is like i mean the way she 
breaks the shapes down in these animals is so beautiful. Um, yeah, she's all she's influenced by Golden Age illustrators, uh, Edmund Dulac and Arthur Rackham. Yeah. She really loved, and. Um, Cause I mean, even I if you like don't see color, even though this page doesn't have color. Okay, let's look at this first. Though. <laughs> I know, I just thought that was so interesting. <laughs> right. But yeah, like to like see how her like her just lines without any color um, help bring the eye move down the page and throughout the pages. But then like when she does introduce color to it, um, how does that affect it too? You know, like so it is fun to see. The different, um, the difference of like doing it just black and white and with color, with you know lines, with color holds, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, oddness. I think oddness is something that we love about Miyazaki's work uh, and about whenever we encounter it. I'm just thinking Miyazaki because his his work is, uh, I think, odd to a lot of Westerners. But I don't, I don't know that it would be less odd uh, in Japan, probably less yeah. odd, but there's oddity. Um, there's real kind of uh, cachet with oddity. <laughs> like, it's like, a, you know, it's it. people turn their heads, you know, oh, that's weird. It's a, you know, a fish with legs or, um, you know, a, a, a nursing uh, statue. I, s I remember going, walking through the Met and you'll mm -hmm. see these like African statues um, I don't know if this is African necessarily, but, um, yeah, like, there'll be these, river. like, just, like, nursing mothers of these <laughs> statues of, like, giant breasts and nursing these kids. And so, yeah. and seeing that in, like, in the way she draws it, that was pretty cool. Um, sorry, going back to Air Crawl, I just realized <laughs> I never th finished that thought. Um, but, like, he was saying how, um, just, like, where ideas come from of, like, taking the outside and inside source, the inside being your feelings and like things that like you take away from like an experience, but then the outside being things that you don't necessarily allow. It just happens to you, like your experiences and like your influences and letting that like, and sometimes that may be through books or through other, you know, but through like actual life experience and all letting all of that kind of build up in your creative bank and um, how that, how you translate that. Like everything is a combination really in a way. Um, and so seeing how Pauline does it I, with her, yeah, I'm curious, yeah. I mean, this is just years and years of practice, obviously she, there's so much, there's so much work in this book. So much like, nudity as well. <laughs> <laughs> which uh it, it's interesting because it's not pornographic it's a uh, it's it's simply um iconographic yeah. um <laughs> which i think is really delicate like it's mm. there's very difficult difficult things on every level but that is uh one of them where you know people don't always know how to do it um and it's like there's only one way to do it yeah. um and i think she's showing us that there's more than one way to you know, get these ideas and images across that evolve. Nudity. There's um, when I, Ben was talking about oddity, it made me think about two quotes that I read recently in a interior design book. Um, the book is called um, "Every Room Should Sing," and it's written by uh, Beta Human. If that, I think that's how you say her name. Um, but one of the quotes is, uh, a little bad taste is like a nice splash of paprika. We all need a splash of bad taste. It's hearty, it's healthy, it's physical. I think you could use more of it. No taste is what I'm against. And not that, it, I, it's, I'm not saying that Miyazaki or, you know, Pauline Baines are, has bad taste, but those oddities can sometimes come across as bad taste, I think. But then I think because of that, it brings a lot of charm it makes the eye turn and it makes you kind of like get engaged in the um the art itself and the story sometimes like you kind of have to force down a little bit of um fear risk at being odd it's kind of you have to risk uh being odd and having some eclectic um uh even beliefs i think all of these 
all of these um, images are built on beliefs of different people and different cultures. And um, I think it's kind of hard to keep uh, modern beliefs or beliefs in a modern world, I think, um, whether it's religious or, uh, um, or, or virtuous, you know, old virtues. Um, they seem to uh, get washed out in a lot of pragmatism today. It's like, well, does it sell or um, is it, is it uh, you know, monetarily motivated? You know, this is how we this is how we classify things as success is if they're um, if they're if money comes from them. If people if the market wants it and decides that they want it, well, this is good art. Um, but uh, I think a lot of art that is the best art is made in devotion to something, some idea, some principle, um, I think someone you, or some yeah. thing. I think when you think about music too, like um, someone who's a composer or, you know, any musician, you have to study um, the classical, you know, the tradition of music, the theory of music. Um, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> this is like a swamp thing. I mean, it's just like a technique class. Like this whole book is just like full of traditional pen and ink technique. This is crazy. I mean, this is like anything, you know, you would see in the craziest comic book um, from like EC Horror or anything like that. Like, sorry. That no, you're fine. Crazy. Um, yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, like, um, and musicians don't run away from tradition. Um, we, yeah, like, I think we all kind of acknowledge that there, even in jazz, you know, like, um, there's... You gotta a, have the, a, some foundation. Yeah. Um, we're not, we're not just, um, we can't, and we shouldn't just erase the whole, our whole history of, uh, uh, cultures. We should bring them forward mm -hmm. and, um, continue to translate the true, true elements um, and not just uh, materialist, materialistically true elements, but the um, the true elements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, coming to an end, but like, oh, like this is crazy. Like, oh, a field of flying horses and lightning over it. <laughs> like that's so, uh, that's so like, uh, rock. <laughs> of course, a lot of rock uh, pulls from like Norse imagery. Here's it, uh, may I pronounce that, Yggdrasil, the world tree. Mm. A whole conception of the world and how it's set up um, which is, you know, I would say more interesting than the globe. <laughs> um, just in, a, in a, if you're interested in building a fictional world, um, think about how other people have constructed worlds in their cultures, um, and whether or not they actually believe this this was so, or that it was the way in which they conceived it in order to uh, move them a certain direction that they that they thought was the best direction to go in. <laughs> it's super creepy. And like every image here is like a spot illustration, but it could also be a cover. So like there's a lot of covers and poster and you know movie posters or um, comic book covers that are just like you know, large head, small characters, uh, you know, vehicles, and there's a great stacking and um, type of thing. And uh, this is an odd one to go out on, but this is the last image, and it's, a, <laughs> and it's very, I don't know if this was used for Tolkien or this was just made for this book, but really dreamy, weird landscape. It's concept art for Tolkien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
some maps of where these things came from. And that's the book. Okay, I just want to show the back of this as well. Farmer Gals of Ham's cover on a paperback. Love it. So, uh, Karen, as I just, as I let you know, I ordered, um, I found five copies of these. Um, and if anyone would like one, uh, message me, email me, um, and we'll, uh, I'll sell them to you when they arrive to me. <laughs> um, and I think uh, this is just uh, a masterclass in symbolic um, imagery and just in, it, it'll get you going. It'll get you sketching uh, every day if, if you just look and, and try to trace or um, copy or draw one of these image, images every day. Uh, it'll, it'll set you up really well for uh, getting into play and fun and, um, and drawing um, and you learn quite a bit. So if you're an interested uh, book collector, obviously um, it's a good find, but uh, if you're an artist as well, um, this would be a fantastic uh, resource for you. So let me know if you want one um, and uh, that's all. Um, before we go, uh, I'll just note again that I'm working on Joe Death and the Graven Image. You can follow me on um, Benjamin Shipper at uh, Instagram um, and sign up for my newsletter. Uh, and I uh, hope this wasn't too boring. Um, but Karen. And, yeah. yep, get some cards on karenshipper.com. <laughs> You're out of this world. See you next time. Yeah, don't wait to uh, to do something for Valentine's Day this year. <laughs> this is your year. Get, get something special for you someone special. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Bye.